Hi there, um, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'll be going through the Brand Finance Singapore 100 Most Valuable Brands 2022 results. The theme of this year is uh, Singaporean brands supporting the nation's post-pandemic re recovery. And I'll be delving a little bit into detail of that over the next few slides. But firstly, if I just talk about myself, so uh, my name is Alex Hay. I am the new uh, managing director for Brand Finance Asia Pacific. Uh, I'm a chartered accountant and chartered tax advisor, having trained in the UK. I uh, also hold a marketing MBA from Marketing Week uh, and uh, have about 10 years experience of uh, market research, brand strategy, um, brand valuation, marketing data and, anal and analysis within brand finance. Uh, I am backed up in my, in my role by a, a, a team in 25 countries. But think particularly in Asia Pacific, we are present in eight. So India, Sri Lanka, China, Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, and Australia. Uh, a key part of the way we work is to work cross country. And so we bring all of our international experience into the fore when we're working with clients. Uh, and what we do for clients really is that we help connect marketing to finance. So since we was set up in 1996, 26 years ago. Our raison d'etre has always been to help make marketing data more accessible and understandable to wider business audiences, in particular to finance teams, to CEOs, and to people making strategy. In order to do this, we have a, a unique combination of market research expertise, valuation and strategy. And that fits into the sort of three key areas of services that we offer. First, we start off with, with research where we're looking primarily at what people think about brands and how that affects what they, how they interact with them. Then on to valuation, looking at how brand equity and perceptions impact on the financial performance of uh, the businesses that they're applied to. And then finally, strategy, where we are using our research and using our model to help make, help our clients make better strategic decisions grounded in financial value. And that might cover brand architecture, brand positioning, licensing, all sorts of areas that are related to the management of brands. In order to do that, we think data is very important. And so we have uh, over the last I think it's 14 or 15 years been preparing the world's most expensive public database of brand value backed up by research that covers uh, over 100,000 respondents worldwide. We also rely on our relationships and our adherence to standards set by a wide array of international organizations. So the Marketing Accounting Standards Board in the US, uh, the International Valuation Standards Council, the various ISO standards, the various chartered accountancy boards that we're part of, and all sorts of other organizations. We, a, a, a key part of what we're doing, a key part of what we want to show is that we are helping to build the standards that govern intellectual property valuation, and particularly brand valuation, in order to build trust in the practice and make them as usable as possible for, for people who see the results. And as part of that, we do uh, brand valuations for 5,000 brands per year. And we split that by sector, and we can go right down to sort of very low level sectors of dairy, tires, wine, and right up to the larger sectors of banking, for example, or insurance or telecom. Those are the sector publications and those help us to put together our country rankings, which I'm going through now. So for anyone who is interested to understand the benchmarks in their sector, 
as well as the benchmarks within Singapore as we're going through today. Uh, I invite you to look at branddirectory.com, which is our, our the website which covers our, uh, our data delivery. Um, and, uh, and to take a look at the sector reports that we do on your sector. So briefly, before I get into the actual results from our, our study, I wanted to briefly run over why brands create value for businesses, because we take the theory of how brands bring value to businesses and use that in our methodology and in our results. Our research found that the, the business impact of brands is very material. In fact, on average, brand value makes up over 20% of business value. This is because of brands benefits for and therefore impact on the various stakeholders. So if we think of the brand impact on customers, our research has found that well-known brands with a good brand equity, good brand strength, have more leads higher product trial, higher prices, stronger loyalty, and a variety of other benefits. We also found that stronger brands help build the profitability and value of their businesses over time. Uh, in fact, we oh, and you'll see on the next slide, the share value of businesses with strong brands grows by 1.7 times the speed of the market overall. Related to this, financiers will also offer cheaper capital to stronger brands and strong brands reduce perceived risk and, and therefore reduce finance costs. In fact, we, we recently did some research that suggests that strong brands can borrow money at an average of 2.4% less than weaker brands. Those benefits extend also to employees. So lower recruitment costs can be, can be enjoyed by stronger brands. Our, our research has found that CEOs of strong brands accept uh, considerably less pay per annum than than comparable weaker brands. And then finally, brands with a strong reputation are also more likely to, to gain government contracts, avoid legal and public action, and, and experience similar benefits like that. This is key for our, for our valuation process because we are weighing up all of these benefits in order to finalize our, our brand valuation and understand the strength of brands. But then following that, the valuations themselves and the analysis that goes underneath it are clearly relevant to all of these different departments within businesses. And obviously, what does this mean for business performance? So yes, I said tw around 20% of business value is, is related to brands, but we can also use the analysis from our, from our ranking to help show what will happen in the future to the business. So, we went away and we had a look at uh, the impact or the, the results of the top brands in our study. We created a pool of the top 10 every year and saw what would happen if we had invested our money at the, at the start of the period. And what this shows is that there's a strong outperformance of the, of the AAA rated um, brands in our study. And they actually outperformed the market, that is the S&P 500, by 70%. So 1.7 times the growth. And you don't just need to sort of take our word for it. The analysis that's gone into this has now gone into the formation of uh, two indices, two investment indices, which are used for various financial products to help people make the most of the predictive power that uh, brand valuation uh, and brand values uh, can give. But obviously, as you can see from this, this adaptation of a graph by Les Burnett and Peter Field of the IPA in the UK, obviously brand building takes time. And all of the most successful brands in our study have taken consistent long-term strategic bets on brand building investment. Because while short-term sales activation type marketing is good to start with, the long-term benefits of highly creative, believable, and well-resourced brand investment is clear. But that's the theory. So uh, now we'll just get into the calculations. 
and I also get into the detail of who comes out on top. So firstly, I'll just talk about the brand valuation methodology. So at Brand Finance, we use a methodology known as the royalty relief method. It attempts to find the value that brands bring to businesses by looking at what people have paid for them in the past. So sounds reasonably simple. And given the simplicity of this concept, it's the preferred methodology of courts and tax authorities, and it's backed up by the ISO standards 10668. The principle behind it is that if you didn't own your brand, how much would you pay to license it? Since you do own your brand, the real question is how much value are you saving by not having to license it? And in order to work out that value that you save, there are four key pillars in the valuation process. Firstly, the brand strength index. What we're trying to look at here is how strong the brand is compared to competitor brands. We create a composite index where we use a variety of different measures covering multiple stakeholders to benchmark the brand against competitors. This then gives us gives each brand a strength score out of 100, which I'll get into a little bit more detail later. After this, we identify how important the brand is in the sector, or in fact, in the product segment, um, since many brands operate in multiple segments. And that's compared to other assets within similar businesses. So what we're effectively trying to do is find out what proportion of revenue and profit is reasonable to expect a brand or brands in general to be com contributing to the business in comparison with other sectors. Here we first find a range of what could reasonably be expected to, pay, to be paid for the brands in the sectors. And then we use the brand strength to find what each brand would be able to charge. Stronger brands could charge more, weaker brands less. Then we look at the underlying business. The big, bigger the business is likely to be in the future, the higher the volume of purchases the brand will affect. So obviously there is an interplay between the strength of the brand and revenue growth, but the underlying size of the business is also a key component. Uh, finally, what we need to do is take what these steps have found, which is the impact of the brand on profit and revenue into the long term future, um, and then turn that into a value today. So what would effectively what we're trying to see is what would someone pay to own that future stream of income right now? What we need to do in order to do that is, is use a discount rate in order to take account of the so-called time value of money and apply other valuation assumptions in order to get the brand value today. And as you can see below, all of these steps are covered by the ISO standard. And in order to back up this first step, the brand strength assessment, which is in many ways uh, the most complicated, we conduct research in over 30 countries. And you can see in Asia slash Pacific, we're covering 10 countries. Within Singapore, we're actually covering 10 sectors, and uh, these are the biggest in Singapore according to brand value, which is why they've been picked. Depending on the sector, uh, we either use an extended list of questions covering the brand funnel, uh, brand usage, uh, reputation, image attributes, loyalty, adv advertising recall, uh, and, and some other questions around momentum, likability, that kind of thing. Or we use a summarized list of representative attributes. So these attributes are much summarized, but they tend to uh, be explained by the other attributes that are within the tier one question. So I won't go into the detail of which sectors are in which at the moment, but please be in touch if you'd, if you'd like to know about your sector or your brand. Um, so with that data, one thing we like to do is to summarize what are the most reputable brands by country. Uh, obviously tells us a lot about the country and the brands that are, that are sort of picked. If you look at this first list, you can see that many of the top brands 
are sort of natural champions or, or national champions even. Uh, and, and in fact, they're most reputable in their own market. So they're international brands that are champions around the world, but they are most reputable within their country. Often we see in, in smaller markets, these international brands are also the most dominant. And there isn't something that, there isn't a sort of local brand that really uh, has that same level of reputation. Which is why in Singapore, it's good to note that uh, local brands really do hold their own. So Singapore Airlines is the most reputable brand, followed by Google, Microsoft, and then Changi, Ikea, Fairprice, Sheng Siong, DBS, Emirates, Sony. So five out of 10 is a pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, result, to be honest. And I just want to make the point that researching reputation is very key within this whole process. So it's a measure that is very influenceable by marketing departments and businesses, and it is a key indicator of brand consideration, as you can see here in the banking sector. A higher reputation tends to lead to a higher consideration. And really consideration is split into two parts. So firstly, familiarity. Are you well enough aware of what the brand offers for it to enter onto your potential list of options? Secondly, consideration relevance. So are you actually going to consider them when you're familiar with them? Uh, Bearing that in mind, those two parts of consideration, we created a, a measure, which is sort of like a shortcut to brand strength, an easier way to, to get an idea of how strong a brand is or not. And that is what we've called brand beta. And effectively, it shows how popular a brand is. And it has a very highly uh, high correlation with, with market share in most sectors. And again, Singaporean brands uh, fare very well in this. In, in, in the table here. So the most popular brands tend to be Singaporeans. And what does that mean? What does that strength mean for, for the Singaporean nation, the Singaporean nation brand? I just wanted to touch briefly on what that means. So in our experience, there is a pretty clear reciprocity between corporate brands Firstly, they will use national brands for their own causes, but also, uh, but also corporate brands can have very big impacts on, on the national brands they represent. So the Singapore Girl, for example, synonymous with both Singapore Airlines and the country. And Singapore Airlines represents many of the best features of the nation overseas. Similarly, VW and the other big auto companies both use the image of, of uh, German engineering being the best in the world, and also add to it as they innovate. And those perceptions, building those perceptions and using them is key because it, it helps other businesses by within the nation by, by stimulating local demand, helping build national pride, and then overall just sharing out the prosperity and success. But it also helps to create uh, more interest overseas for local investment, tourism, trade, and talent attraction. And in Singapore, we can see that all coming through. So, in fact, when we look at Brand Finance's global soft power study, which we launched for the third year running in March, despite being one of the smallest countries in the world, Singapore ranks 20th overall in global soft power. And our study is measuring over 100,000 people in more than 120 countries uh, across a composite of familiarity, influence, and reputation. And familiarity, influence, and reputation are then looked along seven lines of soft power, business and trade, governance, international relations, culture and heritage, media and communication, education and science, and people and values. And Singapore obviously scores well across all of them, otherwise it wouldn't have made the top 20 list, but particularly, business and trade, a measure which is helped by the businesses within, the, within the, the country, it scores very well. And in fact, if we look at a very specific measure here, future growth potential, Singapore, despite being so small in comparison to the other countries on the, on the, on the list, 
has consistently been one of the top brands in future uh, top nation brands sorry in in future growth potential two years running been fifth on the list and especially this year you can see why so now i'll just get into the to the specific results from the the brand valuation which i know you've all been waiting for uh, and i think those these help to sort of back up the point that singapore is ex exhibiting a really strong growth potential here. So this year, what we've seen is a 22% overall growth in brand value in Singapore. So now we're at 53.1 billion US dollars in total. And 22% is a very strong performance. And when you see the report tomorrow morning, so we're, we're releasing formally tomorrow morning, you'll see how many brands are represented in that growth list. It's almost like a sea of green on the first page. You can also see from this graph the dominance of the top brands. So DVS, UOB, OCBC, Singtel are all sort of battling for the top. DVS is very much at the top, but UOB and, and OCBC battling out year on year. And as you can see from the graph, banking takes up a huge part of the value of the table, 35% in total. Given the fact that financial services is only about a fifth to a quarter of GDP. Um, it shows an area of expertise and, and strength for Singaporean brands in particular that is being sort of exploited and, and built on. Then comes telecoms, which is re represented principally by Singtel. I think Singtel has about two thirds of the value here. Um, and then <laughs> importantly, uh, for someone like me, who's been looking for a, a house uh, or a place to live here in, in Singapore, the property market is hotting up uh, again. And real estate and construction brands are actually some of the best performers in uh, our table this year. Uh, and they now make up in total 14% of the total value. Now, the big reveal. So this shows the top 10 most valuable brands in the ranking for 2022. So congratulations to all those brands that have made it into the top 10. Uh, DBS is top in our ranking, and followed by UOB, which has just hit uh, OCBC this year. Then Singtel, followed by Great Eastern, which has grown um, a whopping 55% this year due to the to a confluence of factors, but principally to the adoption of better digital services, a new, more flexible customer service following the pandemic. Singapore Airlines comes next, it's recovered 36% following the post-pandemic opening up. SPC then follows, having just concluded a rebranding. It now resembles a bit closer to its parent company, uh, but also injects a sort of modernity and energy into the brand identity. NTEUC Income follows. It's, uh, so it's another insurance brand that has grown quite a lot. And then Tiger and o Olam uh, close up the list there. And if we look specifically at DBS, you can see that the most valuable brand, it's the most valuable brand in Singapore and has been for the last decade. Uh, it's grown by 11%, it's now 8.7 billion. Uh, it's taken the pandemic and turned it into an opportunity. So it's improved its digital offering and services, and it's on a mission to make banking simpler and faster and to become less like a bank, as you can see with these images. So DBS, along with UOB and OCBC, are also using their stronger business performance and their growth to help give back a little bit to the community. So they're more involved in CSR activities and have a stronger commitment to sustainability, as you can see with the Climate Impact X um, activity here. I won't go into too much detail though, because uh, we have a, a really great interview in the report from Karen and Gui, uh, who's head of group strategic marketing and communication. Uh, so I recommend you read that and find out a little bit more about that strategy. Also thought I'd just take the take a second to talk about Singapore Airlines, as I've mentioned them a few times now. So Singapore Airlines is roaring back now with 36% with growth. Uh, the brand is the most reputable, as I mentioned, in Singapore, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again in, in the Air Again campaign. Uh, became one of the most one of the best known campaigns here in Singapore 
uh, at the end of last year. Uh, during the pandemic, there was a lot of giving back. Flight crew took on jobs in hospitals, and that's obviously helped to build a closer affinity with the public. And the brand also took advantage of uh, Singapore opening up and has therefore grown uh, one of the fastest in the table this year, especially for the bigger brands. So this, this slide also shows the top 10 strongest brands in the ranking for 2022. So again, congratulations to all the brands that are on the top 10. Uh, as I mentioned before, brand finance determines the relative strength of brands on a balanced scorecard of metrics, covering marketing investment, uh, perceptions, as well as brand related business performance. And taking into account all of those strength measures, Singtel takes the top spot. It's uh, got a score of 87.1 points out of 100. So just for comparison, it's an extremely strong score. If you look at Nike, Nike has got 84 out of 100. So 87 versus 84 shows the, the strength of Singtel. Again, it's digitalization where Singtel is, is, is doing well, just launched and, and widely publicized its 95% standalone 5G nationwide coverage, that was last year. Um, and uh, that's built the brand considerably. Now Singtel is then followed by DBS, Starhub, Changi, Great Eastern, UOB, OCBC, NTUC Income, Singapore Airlines, and then closing out the list is SGX Group. Singtel, taking a close focus on Singtel now as the, as the sort of leader. Uh, the brand value uh, that we've seen is up 22%. Extremely strong for a telecoms brand. Um, it's got a score of 87.1 out of 100. Uh, obviously, the, the feat of opening up 5G to the nation was extremely powerful, useful for the country and for the business itself. It's obviously been, been widely promoted and that's been picked up in our results. So we've seen a, an uptick in familiarity, uh, an uptick in propensity to pay a price premium, and also in the recall of its advert. So now just finishing up with everything uh, that I've gone through, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what can we take from this year's ranking. So firstly, brands are growing strongly again by, by about 22%. That's reflected in the general perception of Singapore as a nation. Future growth potential is on the up. Brands like Singapore Airlines, are acting as standard bearers and as, as the country now continues to open up and more people start to travel, uh, it will be more so. But Singapore Airlines is only one brand and there are other brands that can take this role too. DBS, UOB, OCVC are, are building back, Both, uh, uh, especially digitally, there's lots of digital services being opened up and improved. But there's also more of an emphasis on community support and CSR. Uh, we are doing a series of pieces of, of research looking into the impact of CSR activities, sustainability, uh, and community uh, give back on the strength of brands and their value. And then finally, Singtel's uh, 5G adoption is obviously keeping the, the country ahead technologically. That's why it's the strongest brand this year, but it's also enabling the digitalization, digitalization of services across the, the country that we're seeing in lots of different sectors. Now, uh, that's the end of uh, the presentation. Thanks for joining us. I'm not sure if there's enough time for questions, but there may be one or two. Thanks, Alex. I think we're just um, up to the half eight point, but um, we have had a question come through. Um, so um, the first one, if we do have time very quickly, um, how big of an impact will the increasing need for consideration of sustainability have on Singaporean brands? Um, so it really depends on the sector. And like I say, we're, 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 we're looking at this in, for, in the form of our sustainability index uh, that... Um, Robert Haig, our sustainability director in London, is, is spearheading. What we're trying to identify is uh, what are the kind of key 
attributes that are driving perceptions of sustainability and and uh, corporate um, charity uh, within each sector, because obviously it differs by sector, and then also seeing their results on on business performance. Obviously, sustainability and and CSR is not going to be the primary thing that is causing people to choose brands. Obviously, that's a combination of the the quality of their service and their price, their availability, and all of the normal things. But increasingly, we've seen that people find sustainability and and the actions of of companies more and more important to what they're willing to who who they're willing to give their money to. So, uh, as with everywhere else in the world, Singapore is going to see that um, those sorts of trends affect their value and their strength. Um, and uh, it'll be different by sector. So uh, watch this space for our sustainability index. Perfect, thank you. Um, do we have time? One more question, one more minute, one more question. Um, have you seen any impacts from rising prices on brand strength? So luckily to Singapore, there hasn't been such high inflation that we've seen in other markets. Uh, for example, in in Europe or in the US, so the the impacts are not too severe. But especially in some sectors like oil and gas and and uh, consumer goods, there have been um, some impacts. And obviously, people are upset. We've seen some reductions in in um, net promoter score and recommendation in in some cases, and it needs to be watched out for. Provided that uh, you know it's not the any price rises aren't um uh considered price gouging or uh largely out of whack with similar competitors people tend to be forgiving of individual brands even if they're not uh not happy with the sector overall thanks alex um right well we just come up to well after half eight now 30 minutes um so thank you very much um, thanks all our delegates for joining us today. Um, if you do have any further questions or comments for Alex, please do contact him. Um, the details are on screen now. This webinar has been recorded, so we'll ensure it's on our Brand Finance YouTube channel. The link was shared in the chat. And please um, do take the time to look at the full um, Brand Finance Singapore 100 report link also shared in the chat. Um, thanks so much, everybody, for joining and um, hope to see you all again soon.